thing in. There was quite a bit of spinning. We're going to take that into a physics uh, sort of spin. And it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Joseph Chenar, who's at the Iowa State University and also has the title at Ames National Laboratory uh, in the U.S. So he'll be talking to us about ODMR and EMR techniques uh, for conjugated materials. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you to the organizers for this invitation. Let's move right on. Okay, outline. We're going to first, uh, uh, just a little bit, uh, introduce you to the essence of ESR and basics of ODMR and EDMR. And then we'll, we'll actually dwell quite a bit on results in luminescent high conjugated polymer films, polymer LEDs, fullerene doped polymers. Believe it or not, we did this in 1995 or so. Uh, that includes uh, 360 mixed with uh, PPVs and P poly uh, alkyl thiophenes, um, small molecule films, and small molecular OLEDs. Then we're going to look at the implications of the um, rich uh, results that we have for one thing, the singlet exciton to triplet exciton branching ratio and the internal quantum efficiency of OLEDs. Major issue. Um, had an immediate impact on the stock price of companies like Universal Display Corporation. Talk about exciton quenching processes. Now remember in OLEDs and OEP, OPBs sometimes we refer to opposite things. Um, so um, these are basically processes that um, kill the excitons whether by dissociation or by giving up energy to something else. Talk about bipolarons and trions. Um, and then again uh, implications for OPBs and concluding remarks. Well. Uh, after giving talks like these many times, it finally dawned on me that um, the average listener, um, with a, even with a solid foundation, uh, does not necessarily, he's never worked in ESR or NMR or anything like that. Uh, why should he or she remember? I know I wouldn't if I had to work on it. So I want to uh, remind you what you probably learned over one or two lectures in some third or fourth or fifth year course, uh, what we do in the, uh, in the simplest, most classic conventional ESR experiment is we place a sample containing spins, and for simplicity we'll assume that all we're concerned right now is just with a simple spin one half of an electron, or O, and we put that uh, sample um, uh, in a microwave cavity, and then we uh, put the microwave cavity between the pole pieces of a DC magnet and we crank up the DC field, H. And at the same time we're cranking up the DC field, we're pumping microwave energy, microwave photons into that cavity. And then something may or may not happen at a special field, which we call the field for resonance, and that field is characterized by the equality between the energy of the microwave photon, that quantum of energy of the microwave photon, and the energy splitting between the spin up versus spin down of that spin one half. So we get um, uh, resonant absorption, uh, typically, of uh, those microwave photons at that field and only at that field. So if we have a very sensitive detector that detects very small changes in um, the, say, the Q of the cavity, which typically has a very high Q, uh, we'll see a sudden change in the uh, microwave uh, energy or, or uh, transmitted to a, a microwave sensitive diode. And so we'll see something going up and then down, and that's our ESR. Okay. And typically the reason that happens is that the microwave photons equalize the spin sublevel populations. So you have a greater population just from thermal <coughs> considerations. You'll have a greater population here than here. And at the field for resonance, you have stimulated emission of uh, photons, microwave photons from, from spins going from up to down. And you have stimulated absorption from down to up. But because you have more down than up, you have a net absorption rather than emission and you see that in your sensitive microwave um, circuit. 
So that's just um, uh, on ESR on your fingertip. What happens in a typical optically or electrically detected magnetic resonance measurement? We still um, expose the sample to the same conditions we expose it in an ESR experiment. We expose it to microwave photons and a DC scan magnetic field, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but we don't detect changes in absorption of microwave energy or anything like that. We detect changes in an optical quantity. That's why it's called optically detected. And so we monitor changes in optical quantities induced by magnetic resonance conditions. So, hence an ODMR experiment is literally a marriage of optical and electron paramagnetic resonance spectrometers. There is a distinct technique called optically detected NMR. Um, I've worked on, I've done ODMR for basically most of 25 years. I know nothing about optically detected NMR. Okay. Um, now optical, as you can imagine, we all use optical as an umbrella term. So it can mean a garden variety of different things. Typically it can mean photoluminescence. So we would monitor changes in the photoluminescence, delta IPL, or simply maybe just a change in the intensity of the total uh, photoluminescence, or maybe a change in the intensity of one of the bands of the photoluminescence. And, uh, or it can mean um, electroluminescence. We actually put an LED or OLED inside the microwave cavity. We don't, then, we don't need any photo excitation source. We just put a voltage across the LED or OLED. It lights up, it gives us electroluminescence. And we look for mi micro uh, changes uh, in the electroluminescence induced by magnetic resonance conditions. Changes in ground state absorption, changes in photo induced absorption, etc. So, similarly, we can perform not just optically, but electrically detected. So, we would say electrical current detected. Actually, electrical current and conductivity is the same thing. At least, we, we measure the same thing. And photoconductivity detected magnetic resonance. EDMR, CDMR, PCDMR, and please uh, forgive me for this alphabet soup, but it's basic. really, I, I haven't found a way to avoid that. But that's basically all the microwave soup, all the alphabet soup. Here. Okay, so as I mentioned, a typical ODMR spectrometer is literally a marriage between an optical spectrometer and a, an EPR spectrometer. As a matter of fact, the first ODMR system I built 26 years ago um, uh, was literally built around um, an ancient variant EPR sp um, spectrometer that the chemistry department at the Technion had actually placed next to the dumpster outside. <laughs> and they just, all you gotta do is pay to haul it from the dumpster to the, to the Solid State Institute and do whatever you want and it worked. They just got a new one, much better. Yeah. Okay. So, PL detected magnetic resonance. Why? Well, as I mentioned, we place a luminescent sample in a microwave cavity, a prime magnetic field, and so magnetic resonance conditions uh, may change, well, typically will change the populations of the spin sublevels, the population of the plus spin half, the population of the minus spin half, the population of the spins in the plus half will change, the population of the spins in the minus one half will change. And if the some decay rates are spin dependent, that means that it might mean that the overall population of the species carrying those spins will change. So if I have spin one half polarons, spin one triplet excitons, their total population, uh, not necessarily, but often does change under magnetic resonance conditions. Now, so far there is nothing to lead me to think I should see anything in a PLDMR experiment. So what if the Polaron population is changing. So what if the triplet exciton population is changing? In the, in, the PL, in the PL, I'm not detecting polarons or triplet excitons. I'm detecting the radiative decay of singlet excitons, well, at least in fluorescent materials, or fluorescence-based OLEDs, as opposed to phosphorescent. So uh, why should I see anything? Why should there be any PLDMR? Well, 
Um, if morons and triplet excitons generate singlet excitons, as they do in delayed fluorescence, then this, spin, this generation is spin dependent for, <coughs> positive and, for positive and negative polaron to generate the singlet exciton. They have to pair up in what we call the singlet pair configuration. And okay, remind you, there are three triplet pair configurations. One, the symmetric combination of this and this. That's two and three. There are three triplet pair configurations, only one singlet pair configuration, the anti-symmetric combination of this and this. Okay? So if polarons and triplet excitons generate singlet excitons, this generation is spin dependent. Of course, triplet excitons, two triplet excitons can pair up in any of six configurations. There are four, because the composite creature has a, um, um, no, actually, eight, nine. <coughs> there are nine configurations. The composite creature, two triplets, has a, may, can have a total spin of two, in which case you would get five sublevels, can have a total spin of one, you can have three sublevels, or zero. That's the singlet. And only one out of the nine will give you the singlet exciton. So uh, this generation of singlets by Polaron combination or triplet exciton fusion is spin dependent in the case of triplet exciton, strongly spin dependent. So magnetic resonance conditions may change singlet exciton, exciton population and consequently here. So if we get a PLDMR due to this bullet, it will be a PLDMR due to changes in the delayed fluorescence. Another very important possibility. Even if polarons and triplet excitons only interact with singlet excitons, they don't actually recombine to give them, or you're not, that's not what you're looking at. For example, they might quench singlet exciton. The resonance may affect spin spot sublevel and overall population of triplet of polarons and triplet excitons. So quenching rate will change because you have more or less polarons and triplet excitons. If you have less, you'll have less quenching. If you have more, you'll have more quenching. And consequently, the PL will change. If you have less quenching, the PL will increase. If you have more quenching, the PL will decrease. So this is what we actually saw. Actually, the first time we saw this in, was at the Technion in 1984, but we didn't really understand what it meant. Um, not that we completely understood what it meant in 1990. We definitely did not, and we'll see that. But this was the very first clear indication that we were looking at some intrinsic um, excitation, the intrinsic, intrinsically generated polarons, in this case in poly 3 hexylthiophene. And the reason this swept right into PRL back then was because this wasn't the only thing we saw. Besides this relatively narrow, about 15 gas wide or so, uh, relatively narrow spin one half resonance, and only at that point we can definitely say this is a spin one half, was because when we uh, jacked up the gain on the lock and amplifier I used to detect this. Uh, so whatever we jacked it up by, say, a factor of 100. And we saw something similar in the PPV derivative, etc. When we jacked it up by a factor of 100, of course, this narrow resonance and, and broadened the sweep of the magnetic field up to a kilogauss from 100 gauss. Of course, this what you saw before is now the central thing, which is way out of scale. But at the baseline, you see something. You see something uh, which those familiar with magnetic resonance of powders and amorphous and liquids and anything sufficiently disordered recognize right away as a power pattern of a, um, of a triplet exciton or a triplet state. And that's what you get when you average those triplets, which, have, uh, which are, um, are not isotropic. So the triplet resonances depend on directions. But when you average overall orientation, because you have a powder or a, an amorphous or whatever, uh, then you get this uh, pattern. And this pattern changed with temperature. And to allay any uh, suspicions, objections, uh, doubts, etc. And this, again, we saw something qualitatively similar in PPVs. You go to half field. Instead of 3.3 kilogauss, which corresponds to delta M, equals plus or minus one of the spin sublevels and those transitions. 
you go to half field, which corresponds to delta n equals plus or minus 2. Now, that'll happen. That's nominally a forbidden transition. But, you know, you go to perturbation theory, you go from uh, first order to second order perturbation theory. Uh, so many things that are forbidden in, uh, in, um, um, in uh, first order are allowed in second order, and this is one of them. And so you go to half field, and you see this unmistakable, unambiguous, completely model independent signature um, of this powered pattern triplet resonance. And this asymmetry of the line shape is another um, uh, classic uh, feature of this type of powered pattern uh, EPR, or in this case, PLDMR. And again, you see it also in PPVs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So first conclusions, uh, before we get to the main issue, the first conclusion was that we were seeing for the very first time really direct evidence of polarons generated by photo excitation of the pi conjugated polymer. This was not obvious that this should be. But, uh, but, and there were various indications that this was happening because if you photo excite a luminescent pi conjugated material, the first thing you do is generate singlet excitons. That's it. You go from a singlet ground state to a singlet excited state in the singlet manifold. That's the first and only thing that happens. Now, if some of your singlets dissociate fission, then you can get polarons, you can get triplets, you can get but They do not necessarily do that. Well, this was the first direct evidence of that. It was also the first direct evidence of triplet excitons generated by photo excitation of the pi now, another thing that was less obvious was that you could analyze the shape of the triplet powder pattern, and for the very first time, uh, we realized, hey, wow, those triplets, that pattern is like a kilogauss wide. The more, the wider the pattern, the more localized the triplets. And there is a, an equation, I won't bother you with it, um, but for that kilogauss wide pattern, that implies the triplets are really localized. Uh, only about three or four angstroms in diameter, but slightly larger than a phenyl unit. This was in such sharp contrast to what was beginning to emerge as the size of the singlet wave function, which was like 30, 40 angstroms, as the as the, almost as delocalized as as, as 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 you can make the the crystal or, or, or the pi conjugated segment. Um, not quite, but certainly much much more. And um, this inverse relation between the width of the powder pattern uh, triplet exciton resonance and the size of the triplet exciton was, uh, we later actually confirmed it so beautifully by comparing the um, triplet PLDMR in C60 versus C70. We only, not only got excellent agreement between the width and the size of that very well-known triplet in C60, which is smeared over the whole sphere, but when we went from C60 to C70, the pattern got slightly narrower because C70 is slightly larger. So um, anyway, those were the first con conclusions. But a nagging question started to emerge. What is the mechanism responsible for these resonances? Why do we see them at all? I mean, we're looking at radiative decay of singlets. Why would polarons and triplets have any effect on the radiative decay of singlets? And so, no answer. But we continued to chug along. We looked at uh, methyl bridged um, uh, ladder type polyparaphenylenes. We did a lot of work with Gunter Leising's group with Willy Krautner and Emil List, who was a grad student at the time. Um, and for example, we, we continued to probe the nature of the spin one half resonance. Um, Parahexaphenyl, uh, methyl bridged ladder type polyparaphenylene. Deliberately slightly oxidized, photooxidized MLPPP. And you can see things that are starting to happen on which the uh, spin one half resonance depends. We also looked at photo induced absorption detecting magnetic resonance. And this was a beautiful, we weren't the first ones to do this. Uh, Valley for Games, we did that back in 1991 92. We just confirmed that they did it on PPVs or something like that, poly 3 alkyl thiophenes. Uh, we did it on these MLPPPs, but we all saw the same thing. No matter what, at the field for resonance, the photo-induced absorption band due to the triplets weakens, so the change is negative. 
and also the photo-induced absorption bands due to polaron transitions, transitions from a low-energy polaron state to a high-energy polaron state. Those are also weakened, so that the change is negative. And this was an extremely important uh, result because it said, again, completely unambiguously, completely model independent. At your, whatever is causing your resonances, one thing you have to make sure fits. The population of the polarons and the triplets decreases at resonance. No way around it. This is completely model independent. Okay, and we continue to chug along. Something more relevant for, uh, for anybody interested in OPVs. Uh, we actually started looking at the, that, that's a mistake, that's PLDMR, I'm sorry. PLDMR, a fullerene doped uh, PPVs and polar 3 alkyls and thiophenes. And we saw again something very interesting, not, not obvious and not trivial. Um, and we looked at PPVs and this uh, something, um, but, and, 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 and two very different things happening when we started doping the PPVs with C60 or C70 and uh, the polythiophenes with C60 or C70. In the PPVs, actually, uh, in the first stage of doping, the resonance went up strongly. So you, and I say, this is the same scale, it goes like whatever units, 8 to 150 or 200. And then, and then it, from between 0 0.1 and 1, it stays about the same. And then when you dope it more and more heavily, the re resonance weakens again. And the polythiophenes, actually, not much happens, and, but it does become weaker upon heavy doping. So whatever your uh, mechanism is that you invoke to explain the resonance, this had better agree with it. And we started looking at um, ELDMR and EDMR. And the first thing we did, looking together with the Richard Friends group, in the first generation of uh, PPV PLEDs, um, hey, um, all the resonances I showed you up to now were positive, except for the photo-induced absorption. But all the PL detected were positive. The PL was increasing under resonance condition, not the EL. The EL decreases. And also the con uh, the this is really EDMR, electrically detected, also negative. Now, um, and, and if we looked at more, more involved, uh, more uh, intricate PLEDs like this bilayer PPV, cyano PPV, we see actually both positive and negative, uh, ELDMR and EDMR. Um, and oddly enough, this was one thing that was much easier to explain. As a matter of fact, at least in one respect, it stood the test of time. Nobody has that to my knowledge, has contested this interpretation uh, uh, over the 18 years since we first reported it. Um, this negative spin one half resonance is due to enhanced formation of bipolar ones. Why, why is that spin dependent? Because a bipolar one, a doubly charged positive uh, dication or dianion or whatever language you want to use, chemist, physicist, whatever, is spinless. So if you take two polar ones and you make Two plus plus, uh, plus plus, or a minus minus, and you and, and you induce them to form this bipolaron. Um, they have to be again in a singlet pair configuration to form the bipolar. So that's a spin-dependent process, and we believe we were seeing the effects of enhanced formation of bipolarons, not contested since first suggested in 1992. And what I'm not showing you, but take my word that we saw, we saw that strangely enough, the strength of the resonance, this negative resonance, decreased with increased excitation. So you crank up the current through your PLED, or, or you will see also small molecular OLED, instead of the resonance not doing anything, delta I over I, or instead of getting stronger, it's actually getting weaker. So, again, what about the mechanism responsible for the positive spin one half polaron and positive spin one triplet resonances? It keeps on nagging. And just to confirm, um, we did uh, some uh, really nice work. Uh, Gang Li, who is now at the Solar Mayor, very heavily involved in OPVs. Um, this was his, the crux of his PhD thesis. Uh, we looked at the ELDMR and EDMR of the classic TPP AOQ small molecular OLEDs. And what he did, something very cute, was to compare the resonances you get when you change this innocent looking buffer 
whether it's one nanometer or so of some dirty ALOX that you just get by deliberately exposing 10 angstroms or so of aluminum to air, or whether it's a much cleaner a one nanometer cesium fluoride buffer layer. So um, just tell you it's kind of maybe a little hard to see that. First of all, the EDMR is qualitatively similar to the ELDMR, and the ELDMR shows that at low temperatures we have the positive resonance. Notice that it, it's not the positive converting to the negative as you crank up the temperature. It's a positive kind of being replaced by negative. It's, there are different resonances. You have the temp intermediate temperatures where you actually get both. Right here, where I'm trying to stabilize my hand right now, um, you see what appears to be a broader, uh, weak negative resonance on top of which you have the remnant weak positive. So um, we understand the negative resonance. We now also understand comparing these things. We finally understood the negative resonance, the formation of bipolar ones, is actually induced by specific sites. In this, set, in this case, sites right here at the, T, at the ALQ aluminum cathode um, buffer region. And that gave us an inkling why this resonance was weakening with excitation power. You were simply saturating those sites. So uh, delta I could not go up and up and up and up with power because there were just so many sites. I was going up and up and up with power. So delta I over I was going down and down and down with power. So uh, negative resonance associated with enhanced formation of bipolar ones at specific sites. In the case of these ALQ OLEDs, these sites are at the organic cathode interface. Delta I over I, the absolute value, decreases with excitation power. In this case, the ejected current because sites are saturated. So while I increases with excitation power, delta I hardly does so, and delta I over I decreases. Again, the nagging issue. What is the mechanism responsible for the positive resonance? And then, well, some more results. In this case, rubric doped ALQ or these. I'm skip that. And the, we can see the, the broad triplet power pattern in the yield the DMR of these rubric doped, et cetera. Uh, again, case, these are carbazol, ethyl, hexo uh, derivatives of PPB. Give very nice um, uh, PLEDs uh, from Jungle Jin's group in Korea. Um, and here you can see, uh, we get actually, depending on the microwave chopping frequency, we chop the microwave because we do locking detection, reference to the chopping frequency of the microwaves. But, and you can imagine, the faster we chop, the more we filter out slower and slower processes. So um, if we chop it at, at, at um, um, let's see, where, um, if we chop at a very low frequency, 217 hertz, we can pick up all processes, fast and slow, even very slow. So you see a negative resonance on top of the main positive resonance. If we chop very rapidly, like at 10 kilohertz, you only see the positive. So implying that this, these processes associated with formation of bipolar ones are relatively slow. Okay, um, another key something that, uh, because Chris Bardeen talked at length yesterday about pentacene, this and that, all these linear uh, ladder type uh, phenylene uh, chain uh, ladders, um, we did uh, quite a bit of work on uh, rubrine, and this is something that uh, we did and then discovered that had, had been done 20 years earlier uh, by Frank Hevich and, and co-workers, and it was a very nice uh, negative triplet resonance. And Frankiewicz explained it very nicely, and we completely agreed with him. What was happening here, that at least the negative triplet resonance, and also relevant for uh, OPVs, is that um, Ruby is one of those cases where the triplet energy is almost exactly half the singlet energy. So if you have isolated Ruby molecules in a solution, you get where they don't talk to, the, to each other, dilute solutions. So um, the singlet cannot fission into two triplets because there are no two molecules right there at the same time. And so the PL quantum yield of uh, dilute rubrine um, uh, in solution is 100%. But in the neat rubrine film, the PL quantum yield drops from 100% to 10%. Why? This is it, a very efficient fission 
of the singlet into two triplets. One triplet where that is singlet is, and the other triplet the neighboring molecule. And so what happens under magnetic resonance conditions? Well, when the singlet fissions into two triplets, we call that pair of triplets, we call that a geminate pair, a pair of these excitations that were born together. And so if you have two triplets born of a singlet, the pair configuration of the two triplets has to be a singlet pair configuration. And it, it settled, certainly at low temperatures, it remains that way for a long time. The spin flip rates are slow. We know that. But you come in with your magnetic resonance conditions, you come in with all your microwaves, and you rapidly scramble the population. So you convert a lot of these pairs that are in the singlet pair configuration to pairs in the triplet or quadruplet configuration. You're talking about two spin one. And those cannot fuse back to singlets. So obviously you're going to have a negative effect on the PL that would come from back fusion of back fusion of two triplets to a single. So again, a nice confirmation of what the ODMR was showing us. Well, grouping was very interesting for another reason, because um, about that time we were also um, collaborating with one of the last surviving groups of Bell Labs, um, and that's uh, um, of. Um, and um, they were making beautiful single crystals of rubrin and deliberately doping them with oxygen because when they did that, they got, at least at the time, the world's record on mobility. Oxygen doped single crystals of rubrin gave them mobilities up to 20 centimeters squared per volt second at room temperature. And so we looked at oxygen doped rubrin, and besides the uh, negative triplet resonance that I'm not showing you, we found this. Uh, negative spin one half resonance that we had seen before in OLEDs and PLEDs, except now we knew a lot more about it. And now we realized uh, that what was happening was that when we added oxygen, we got this resonance because the oxygen center was promoting the formation of bipolarons uh, next to it, next to those centers. And uh, this is something that's been well known, even though it is a bit controversial, whether bipolarons require a counter ion or a counter polaron to stabilize them. Because you have, you, know, you have two positive charges, they repel each other, and so it can't hurt and probably help if you have a counter charge around there to help stabilize it. So probably you have a negatively charged oxygen center and a, a plus plus bipolaron uh, formed here, and this was the signature, and we did a lot of measurements, and again, uh, again, we saw that delta I, uh, where's delta I? This would be delta I. Yeah. Delta I actually, yeah, it looks like it increases with power. You have a lot of these oxygen, but it doesn't increase as much as I itself when you follow it. So delta I over I decreases with power. So, back to the nagging question, and which has by now become the most important question. What is the nature of the positive spin one half resonance that I showed you right at the beginning? That's the last unsolved mystery. And there are two competing scenarios. And now you see why it's so important to solve to answer this question. Why? Well, in the first scenario, off resonance polaron pairs in singlet configuration recombine to singlet excitons faster than polaron pairs in triplet configuration recombine to triplet excitons. So, off resonance in the sense, under steady state conditions, the faster recombination of the singlet pairs means your, the, the population of singlets is depleted relative to the population of triplets. So if under normal conditions, say in an OLED, the population of singlets would be one third the population of triplets, the usual 25-75 ratio, then because of this faster recombination of singlet pairs to singlet excitons, that would be actually less than a third. And then net resonance effect is to convert triplet pairs to singlet pairs, so you get more singlet excitons and more PL. So in effect, what you're saying is that the positive spin one half resonance PLDMA is due to enhanced delayed PL. If this is correct, then the OLED's internal quantum efficiency can be more than 25%. As a matter of fact, a fact by the, uh, the champions and promote, promote proponents of this scenario, it could be as high as 60%. 
If this is the PSI 60%, who needs phosphorescent OLEDs? Down goes the price of UBC shares. I'm not kidding, this actually happened. The other scenario is very, very different. Polaron and triplet exocon populations are reduced at residence. We know this, no ambiguity. This is the photo induced absorption detected magnetic resonance. This is rock solid, model independent. So quenching of singlet excitons by polarons and triplet excitons is reduced at present. You have less polarons, less triplet excitons, you have less quenching. So you have more PL. But then the question is, why are the polaron and triplet exciton populations reduced? They are, there's no doubt, no contest. But why? So the answer is actually something very well known. Open the Bible written by Pope and Swinburne. Uh, first published in 72, second edition published in 1999. And you'll find it in several places in that Bible. You get enhanced spin-dependent annihilation of triplet excitons by polarons. Now, Chris again mentioned this yesterday, and I want to revisit it for a tiny bit. You have a triplet exciton spin one. You have a polaron like this, spin one half. They come together to form a pair. What are the possibilities? They either form spin three halves composite creature, or they form a spin one half composite creature. Only in the spin one half composite creature can the polaron actually absorb the triplet exciton energy and come out with it itself alone, because then you're going from a doublet to a doublet. Fine, spin is conserved. If they pair up in the um, spin three halves configuration, they can't, the polaron can't just kill the triplet exciton because that violates spin conservation. So this is the well-known, strongly spin-dependent triplet exciton, triplet polaron quenching model. And so if this is the correct uh, interpretation of the resonance, then actually um, the uh, yield of singlets really is stuck at around 25%. And there's no way other than the phosphorescent OLEDs. Up goes the share price of UBC. So how do we, we distinguish experimentally between scenario one and scenario two? Well, we were scratching our heads, scratching our heads, and finally we realized, all we got to do is filter out the delayed fluorescence and see if the resonance changes or does not. If the resonance goes down as we filter out the delayed fluorescence and look only at the resonance coming from the fast fluorescence. If that resonance goes away with it, then the resonance really is due to delayed fluorescence, effects on delayed fluorescence. If the resonance stays untouched, then it cannot be on due to delayed fluorescence. And I'll skip and show you. This is, so this is the dash line is what you would expect if the resonance is due to enhanced delayed fluorescence. And this is what we got. And so, um, behavior predicted by delayed, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. As observed, then we saw this again and again in various polymers, polyflex and thiophene, even the double modulation ELB mod. This, this involved what we call double modulation and I won't go into it. So, as far as we were concerned, the, 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 answer, the question was answered. Uh, the mechanism responsible for the positive resonance is reduced quenching. And there is additional strong evidence, very strong evidence for the TPQ model, uh, these various things here. Um, also, this triple polaron quenching model, the TPQ model, can explain the positive spin one half EDM model. Explains why the current uh, goes up under magnetic resonance conditions. Why? Because think about it, the polaron now kills more, more polarons kill more triplet excitons. Well, after the polaron absorbs the triplet exciton energy, what has to happen? Its own energy goes up. So typically it goes from a trapped state to a mobile state, which means the mobility increases. So that's, that's how you can very easily explain the positive spin with an EDM. Finally, an all important note, I want you to realize how central these interactions are these are not esoteric interactions. Think about it. Let's think about photo excitation. In photo excitation, yes, the first thing you get is just 100% singlets. 
But typically, depending on the polymer or the small molecule, you get some fission of singlets uh, to polarons, I'll say 1%. So the they singlet exciton generation rate is about 100% of triplets. So you get 1% polarons, 1% triplets coming from those singlets. So the singlet exciton generation rate is 100 times the triplet and the polaron. And, but the lifetime of the triplets and the polarons, which is 10 microseconds to milliseconds, is typically 10,000 times longer than the lifetime of the singlets. So under steady state conditions, the steady state population of polarons and triplets is 100 times the steady state population of singlets. The vast majority of your excited states under typical conditions are polarons and triplet exit. This is under photo excitations where the first thing you do is just generate singlets. Under carrier rejection in OLEDs, this lopsidedness is even much greater because to begin with, you're generating three times more triplets than singlets. And so this, the triplet exciton and polaron populations are typically 10,000 times the singlet. So TPQ, the triplet polaron quenching interaction, is one of the most important interactions in these materials and devices. Okay, finally, OPBs. Well, we're almost wrapped up. Unfortunately, we're almost wrapped up because this is an early uh, EDMR that um, 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 Diakonov's group did and published back in 1996. Um, it's not exactly a, uh, an OPV, but it might as well could be. And as a matter of fact, our first generation PPB PLEDs we got from Richard Friend um, were, in a sense, OPVs because we were looking at photoconductivity detected magnetic resonance. Very poor photoconductivity. Notice the very strong negative resonance. Delta I over I is 3%. That's a huge resonance in ODMR and EDMR. And we now know why. Why? Because these, based on everything else I've shown you, this resonance is almost certainly coming from the PPPV aluminum interface. In this case, where you don't have any buffer layer, no cesium chloride, no You've got a very, probably a lot of defects, and so there's room for a lot of formation of these bipolar ones, and you get this very strong negative resonance. Um, additional considerations for all these, I'm almost done. I think I'm almost done. Um, I want to go back again to a point that uh, the, the central point of Chris Bardeen's talk yesterday, uh, he was focusing on triplet exciton based OPVs. Remember TPP? The triplet polaron quenching interactions. Carrier will, carriers will quench the triplet excitons. Watch out. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. Because as a polaron quenches a triplet exciton, that polaron gets a very nice kick upstairs, turning it from typically a trapped polaron to a mobile polaron. So while you get less triplets that can fuse to singlets, or, 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 or dissociate, you get less triplets that can dissociate the charges in your OPV, uh, you are increasing the mobility of the polarons in your OPV. Um, preliminary EDMR in good P3 HD PCDM OPVs. We've tried, we see nothing, but um, should we not get bipolarons near electrons? So I, I don't think we've seen the last word on that. And finally, um, there is now, and other people have mentioned this here, there is now talk about this, quote, mid-gap state between the P3HD HOMO and the PCDM LUMO, an intrinsic in that system, mid-gap state. Is there any spin dependence to the dynamics of carriers trapped at that state or not? So, uh, concluding remarks, I've shown you extensive studies of ODMR and EDMR in films and LLEDs, provided striking insight into the dynamics of polarons, excitons, and bipolarons. In particular, on the singlet exciton triplet exciton branching ratio, on exciton quenching processes, charge carrier trapping and detrapping in films and devices. For OPVs, um, I, I want to note something that might have slipped, probably did slip. We saw much, we probably get much more intrinsic fission of singlet excitons to polarons in P3 alkyl thiophenes than in PPVs, and, and leading to many more polarons and triplet excitons. This is probably the reason for much lower PL quantum yield of poly-3 alkyl 5 phase, typically 2%, than PPD films, typically, oh, 20% or so, or ALQ films. 
So we are currently in the state, early stages of ODMR and EDMR studies of OBVs, and please stay tuned, and thank you for your attention. It generates an electric field around it. 
you have a single exciton. So the whole of the single exciton gets pulled in one direction by the electric field generated by the polaron. The electron gets pulled in the opposite direction, and so you enhance the probability that that single exciton will dissociate, fission, dissociate, split <laughs> into an electron and a hole. But that should give you more carriers. Then, that you? should give you more carriers. And I remember many years ago at, at ICSM 2000 in Austria, uh, I think I was talking to Zachido, or one of, and he was claiming that in polymers you get um, uh, the, the polaron absorbs the energy and loss becomes mechanism. loss mechanism. Yeah. In small molecules, the, the, the exciton dissociates, or vice versa. Um, I don't know that I've actually seen evidence one way or the other. We have very strong evidence of field-induced dissociation. These are the classic studies done by um, Kerstig, Lemmer, Basler in the early to mid-90s, where they saw field-induced dissociation of singlets by up to 60% quenching of the PL by field-induced dissociation. The microwave absorption, if we were getting more carriers, our signal would become super linear with the light intensity and it's sublinear. So that means that your, your second mechanism would be the most, so your first mechanism would be the most probable one. The, the just absorption just of the, the absorption, absorption, absorption of the signal energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's a good way to determine it. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I think we're going to have to move on. I'm really sorry to cut this discussion. Let's thank you all for your time.